Chapter 7, 1906, Landslide to Continuity The Liberal Party won the 1906 general election with the resounding victory. Having taken only 183 seats in 1900, they emerged with 397 members of Parliament. The public had spoken. It was an overwhelming endorsement of peace and retrenchment. The country was poised for reform. Former Prime Minister Arthur Balfour lost his Manchester seat but was quickly found but was quickly found another in the city of London. As leader of the opposition, he had protected Asquith, Gray, and Haldane from attacks by the Conservatives in matters of foreign policy. Campbell Manners Campbell Bannerman's first cabinet brought a very vocal and popular liberal into government, David Lloyd George. This young Welsh firebrand clearly stood out as a parliamentarian of considerable potential. So too did Winston Churchill, who had crossed from the Conservative Party two years before and been re-elected as a liberal. Here was a parliament bristling with new faces, keen to bring much needed reform to Britain. Yet, even before the oath of office had been taken, the internal arrangements devised through King Edward, Lord Escher, Balfour, Haldane, Grey, and Asquith ensured that foreign policy remained the preserve of the secret elite. Lloyd George reflected later that, during the eight years that preceded the war, the cabinet devoted a ridiculously small percentage of its time to foreign affairs. Anti-imperialist in the 18-strong liberal cabinet comprised Campbell Bannerman himself. Anti-imperialism, excuse me, anti-imperialist in the 18-strong liberal cabinet comprised Campbell Bannerman himself, Lloyd George, and at least five other radicals. It may legitimately be asked how the Relugus clique could proceed with such a complex war, com complex war conspiracy, when faced with an anti-war prime minister and cabinet, and cabinet. The straightforward answer is that they kept everyone else completely in the dark about their activities, although cabinet members and backbenchers frequently questioned foreign policy. Gray and Haldane repeatedly lied to them. It would be many years before the other cabinet members learned of the dangerous military compact that had been secretly rubber stamped. Campbell Bannerman left the all important foreign policy to Sir Edward Gray, concentrating instead on issues such as Irish home rule and the alleviation of poverty. He was highly popular in the country at large, but endured the double, the double whammy of having his authority undermined by the Relugus III and suffering a personal tragedy. Shortly after Campbell Bannerman became Prime Minister, his wife and his separable companion, Lady Charlotte, took ill and died. It was an inestimable, inestimable blow. Campbell Bannerman's mental anguish unnerved him. The love and affection that had bound the couple together tortured him in his loss. Drained by the demands of office and his personal agonies, he cut a sad and lonely figure. The Irish MP T.P. O'Connor wrote of him, The Prime Minister in 10 Downing Street was less happy than the cottager that tramps home to his cabin. He was visibly perishing, terribly, looked terribly old, and some days almost seemed to be dying himself. There was little doubt in the minds of anybody who watched him that if the double strain were prolonged, he would either die or resign. Campbell Bannerman was a broken man, and the Relugus III in the top cabinet post of foreign office. Exchequer and war office pursued their cause without interference. One measure of how successfully they functioned was Lord George's revelation that 
Every aspect of Britain's relations with France, Russia, and Germany was met with an air of hush-hush. He possibly did not realize how accurately he summed up Gray's dictatorial control of foreign policy and cabinet when he confessed that he was made to feel that he had no right to ask questions, since this was the reserve of the elect. How right he was, the information given to cabinet was carefully filtered and facts that would have enabled sound judgment were deliberately withheld. Sir Edward Grade retained a tight personal grip on foreign policy with the cabinet, but he never wielded real power inside the foreign office. Gray was the figurehead behind which the real power operated. The secret elite placed him in the foreign office, not for his capabilities or knowledge of foreign affairs, but because he was loyal and did as they advised. Gray was never Campbell Bannerman's choice for foreign secretary. At least four other major politicians had better credentials, but Campbell Bannerman had effectively been given little choice in the appointment. The Relugus III came as a package. Gray was a staunch imperialist on the extreme right wing of the Liberal Party and possessed no conspicuous intellectual talents. He had idled his way through Balliol, Balliol College from where he was sent down from his indolence for his indolence before being awarded an inglorious third class degree. His outlook was utterly parochial. Northumberman was the center of Edward Grade's world, and he knew more about its rivers and streams than the business of running an empire. His lack of interest in politics at university was clear to all, yet he became an MP at the age of 23, although his family connections secured him a ministerial ministerial post as undersecretary at the Foreign Office from 1892 to 1895. His inept performance almost led to conflict with France. On leaving, he wrote in his diary, I shall never be in office again, and the days of my stay in the House of Commons are probably numbered. A legion of observers would now add, if only... Paradoxically, in the years when Britain was increasingly committed to a continental policy, her affairs were directed by one who seldom traveled outside of British Isles and who had little first-hand knowledge of Europe and spoke no French. His very appointment was a paradox. Gray was unpardonably rude to Campbell Bannerman, telling him point blank that unless he took a peerage and transferred his leadership from the common to the Lords, he, Gray, would not take any part in the government. Gray did not want to serve under a man whose contempt for Alfred Milner he resented and with whose espoused pacifism he was completely at odds. But the secret elite insisted. Gray's points of reference came not from cabinet debate or House of Common motions, nor from his own independent judgment, but from Grillions and the club, and from weekend collusions with the Milner Group in select stately homes. It is conceivable that one man, one modestly educated man who, despite all of, all of his advantages, never crossed the sea until 1914, nor spoke any foreign language, had the capacity to single-handedly control the foreign policy of the empire and control it so well that his judgment was held in great esteem. Nah. Gray was surrounded to the foreign office by seasoned permanent secretaries like Sir Charles Harding or Sir Arthur Nicholson who were proven establishment men and associated with the secret elite. Hardinge was one of the most significant figures in the formation of British foreign policy in the early 20th century. In the early 20th century. As a close confidant of King Edward, he traveled widely with him and played an important role in both the Entente and the understanding with Russia. Sir Arthur Nicholson 
later Lord Karnak, who played a similar role in, role in guiding Gray in the Foreign Office, was always in the center, at the center at critical moments in Morocco, St. Petersburg, and eventually as permanent secretary to London. Permanent secretary in London. They controlled Britain's diplomatic reach across the world while Gray fronted and deflected questions in Parliament. Gray's presumed gravitas, his magisterial airs, as Lord George bitterly described them, his advantage in society, his correctitude of phrase and demeanor which passes for diplomacy, invested in him a sense of the untouchable. He seemed to be above reproach. He appeared to know what other mortals did not know. It was rarely his place to have to explain himself to Parliament. He did not consider himself answerable to the large radical wing of the Liberal Party. In truth, as Neal Ferguson observed, there was more agreement between Gray and the opposition front bench than within the cabinet itself. To say nothing to the Liberal Party as a whole, his contemporaries found him daunting, aloof, and all too prepared to keep his own counsel. Gray did not argue his case, but gave a judgment to which even cabinet ministers felt there was no appeal, and few ever made one. On the odd occasion that his policy was questioned, he would twist and turn at each set of objections, voicing dire consequences for the nation's security or threatening resignation if crossed. With no strong center of opposition to him within the Liberal Party, Gray had little problem operating above cabinet scrutiny. He had none of Haldane's brilliance, Asquith's capabilities, or Lord George's eloquence, but he had credibility built on a myth. Promoted by a supportive right-wing press, Sir, George, Sir Edward Gray was above reproach. The industrial magnate, Sir Huge Bell, the industrial magnate, Sir Huge Bell, who worked for a time with Gray on the running of the North Eastern Railway, said Gray is a good colleague because he never takes any risks and he is a thoroughly bad colleague for the same reasons. Such a description hardly resonates with that of a key decision maker in charge of the most prestigious department of government in the British Empire. The Foreign Office was the hub of the Imperial Spider's Web, linked, with, linked through diplomatic and commercial channels to every part of the globe. Its incumbent, its incumbents plotted and planned ceaselessly for the good for the good of the empire and the benefit of the secret elite. Gray was the perfect figurehead, but it was Harding and Nicholson who turned secret elite policies into practice. In the war office, Richard Haldane required no minders. He had the vigor, determination, and intellect to tackle the mammoth task of reorganizing a military setup that was soaked in historic tradition and riddled with vest in vested interests. The British Army still offered commissions to the sons of the noble and wealthy. Rank and its privilege were available at a price. Haldane approached his new job in the confident knowledge that he had, to com he had the complete backing of King Edward, Lord Escher, and Alfred Milner. He told the House of Commons on the 12th of July, 1906, that he intended to remold the army in such a fashion that it shall be an army shaped for the only purpose for which an army is needed, for the purpose of war. His main problem came not from the army council, but from within his own party, burning with the zeal for social reform. And how they knew he had to cut army expenditures to win the support of his own MPs and at the same time find the resource to invest in a different kind of fighting force. He did this by dismantling coastal defense batteries with obsolete guns, closing a number of forts around London, reducing artillery and systematically reviewing 
all the constituent parts of the army with one question in mind. What is your function in war? Where Haldane did run into objections from traditionalists over the changing role of the militia and volunteers, he was able to call on support from King Edward, who summoned the Conference of Lords Lieutenant from every shri- from every shire and country from every shire and county of the British Isles to make clear his expectation that Haldane's reform would have their active endorsement. The secret elite could not have made their aims clearer. They would have a modern army fit for the coming war. Reforms included the creation of a general staff and, most crucially, the concept of an expeditionary, a expeditionary force. Haldane had faith in the premise that the fleet would defend Britain's coast, while the first purpose of the army was for overseas war. He built a dedicated expeditionary expeditionary force of one cavalry and six regular divisions, which comprised 5,546 officers and 154,074 men. Haldane introduced an imperial general staff, including military leaders from Britain's overseas dominions, and promoted officer training corps in universities and public schools, which marginally extended opportunities to lead from the aristocracy to the wealthy upper middle class. Few would have expected such an achievement in barely two years, but Haldane's extraordinary success was backed by the most powerful of the secret elite allies, including the monarchy, the senior military officers, and the Times. He also gained the parliamentary support of the Liberal Party, of a Liberal Party that had no understanding of his real purpose. Their minds were focused on the millions he cut from unnecessary spending. One of the lessons Haldane learned was that a great deal of future coordination would be required to get the expeditionary force mobilized and transported to France in good time. When he took office, Sir Edward Grey informed the British ambassador to Paris, Sir Francis Bertie, that it would take two months to mobilize 80,000 men. The French were mightily underimpressed. Prime Minister Clemenceau visited Britain in April of 1907 and tried to persuade Haldane and Asquith to introduce conscription and create a great army that would take the field along with France against Germany. This French agitation was met with polite refusal. However, two points were worth noting. First, at the highest level of parliamentary government, both countries discussed war against Germany. Second, Clemenceau must have been very badly briefed if he imagined that the Liberal Party would for a moment contemplate compulsory compulsory military service, but the, com- but the conversations continued apace. Haldane's biggest problem lay with the senior service as the Royal Navy styled itself. Haldane's biggest problem lay with the senior service as the Royal Navy styled itself. Preparation for an expeditionary force required joint naval and military planning. but The Navy did not take kindly to the idea of providing a ferry service for the Army or playing a subordinate role to it. It had, after all, been for centuries the most formidable naval fighting force in the world and at the forefront of British Empire building. Haldane quickly realized that there was no semblance of cooperation or even understanding between the Admiralty and the War Office. The past experience of wartime cooperation between the Army and the Navy was one long record of virtually unbroken misunderstandings and failure, mistrust and blame. In an attempt to bridge the gulf, Haldane used the Committee of Imperial Defense to promote the concept of a naval war staff. Sir Charles Otley, then Secretary of the Committee of Imperial Defense, wrote to him in some exasperation, 
Not one naval officer out of the 50 has any knowledge of what the British fleet will have to do in the war or how it will do it. The Navy had a great and historic tradition, but the secret elite needed to ensure control from the inside in the same way as they had with the army. Haldane did all he could to instigate change from the war office, but knew that but knew in his heart that the Navy could only be properly reformed from within the Admiralty. The man to whom they looked for help was Admiral Sir John Jackie Fisher. But the first sea lord was a man who had been allowed to plow his own passage and dictate his own policy. Fisher was ill disposed to tolerate any military or worse French interference. He was perfectly agreeable to the secret elite's coming war, but did not believe in an expeditionary, expeditionary force being sent to Belgium. His preference was a joint naval and military attack on Schulis Wig Holstein at the northernmost tip of Germany. It was a venture dismissed by both the British and French general staffs as impractical. The son of an army officer serving in India, Fisher had joined the Navy as a 13-year-old in 1854 and quickly rose through the officer ranks. In the early 1880s, when his duty as captain of HMS Inflexible brought him into close contact with the royal family, Prince Albert Edward, Prince Albert Edward befriended him, befriended him. Fisher contracted malaria in 19... In 1883, and during his recuperation, Queen Victoria invited the dashing captain to stay with her at an Osborne at Osborne Osborne House for a fortnight. Five years later, on his promotion to rear admiral, the Queen appointed him her aide de camp. Thereafter, she knighted him in her birthday honors in 1894. Like Richard Haldane, Jackie Fisher did not belong to the establishment. He boasted, I entered the Navy penniless, friendless, and forlorn. I had to fight like hell, and fighting like hell has made me what I am. He has, prog he has progressed through the ranks, and by the fates of fortune, had been drawn into the elite circles surrounding the monarchy. Like Haldane, he was, an able, he was an able man. Both were tasked with bringing the country's armed services to the 20th century. In October of 1904, Fisher had breakfast with his good friend King Edward at Buckingham Palace and thereafter was sworn in as first sea lord. Both the Army and the Royal Navy were, at that point, in the hands of loyal servants of the secret elite, whose friends in high places were undoubtedly a factor in elevating Fisher to the Navy's top job. He was a man of vision who didn't hesitate to instigate revolutionary reform that made the Royal Navy more effective for the job in hand. He valued ships for their fighting worth, and in 1904, with the German Navy still in its infancy, he began a ruthless, relentless, and remorseless reorganization of the British fleet. The Navy was purged of 160 ships that, in his own words, could neither fight nor run away, and Fisher replaced them with fast modern vessels ready for instant war. The 20th century heralded many advances in technology. And where this meant improvement and a better and more efficient Navy, Fisher never hesitated. He improved the range, accuracy, and fire rate of naval gunnery, introduced torpedo boats and submarines to the fleet, and as first sea lord was responsible for the building of the first huge dreadnought battleships. Of all Fisher's innovations, however, the most crucial was, was the introduction of oil to replace coal-fired boilers. Despite old-school admirals labeling him an eccentric dreamer, he insisted that fueling the Navy with oil would give Britain huge strategic advantages. There would be no tell, tell, there would be no tell-tale smoke to alert enemy vessels 
and while nine hours might be required for a coal fire ship to reach peak power, it would take only minutes with oil. Twelve men working at a twelve hour twelve men working a twelve hour shift could fuel a vessel with oil while the equivalent energy for a coal fired ship requires the work of five hundred strokers for five days. Five hundred stokers for five days. Crucially, the radius of action of an oil-powered vessel was up to four times as great as oil, coil, coal. Crucially, the radius of action of an oil-powered vessel was up to four times as great as coal. Fisher got his way, but not without a tense and often bitter struggle with the liberals and socialists in Parliament, who deemed the vast expenditure on new developments in naval warfare costly and wasteful. Fisher's task of changing the framework of command within the Navy was particularly challenging. By 1900, a naval officer would have found little difference in his career structure from the time of Nelson. Despite early reforms in 1902, the Fisher's long crusade to widen and democratize recruitment, the naval high command, like that of the army remained the narrow preserve of the upper classes. Promotion was bound rigidly by the rules of seniority and class. As the Naval and Military Review later stated, the British Navy has long obtained an ample supply of capable officers without recruiting from the democracy to any visible extent. We should view with grave apprehension any attempt to offer the fleet at all largely with men of humble births. Such ingrained prejudice hampered Fisher in his reforms that he could, would not have survived without the support on which he was able to call. Although he did a sterling job in improving the Navy, Fisher presented Haldane and the Committee of Imperial Defense with problems. He was a stubborn autocrat with a huge ego. He knew it all. No committee would be telling him what to do with his navy if Germany was to be taken out. It was a job for him and his beloved ships. On the 12th of April, 1905, with the Moroccan crisis threatening to boil over into war, the first sea lords and Lord Lansdowne attended a meeting of the committees of imperial defense, after which Fisher immediately after which Fisher intimidated to the, intimated to the foreign secretary that the dispute was a golden opportunity to bring forward war with Germany. Ever the war hawk, Fisher confidently predicted he would have the German fleet, the Kiel Canal, the Kiel Canal, and Shoeless Whig Holstein without within a fortnight. Little wonder that the Kase was able to claim in, 19, in July of 1905 that if it came to war, the British fleet would be mobilized, seize the Kiel Canal, and land 100,000 men in Schwitz and Schoolwisk's Holstein. Fisher's ambition to use the Navy in a preemptive strike against Germany had clearly been shared with the Kase who told the French press no matter how often it was denied by the British government, this caused, this caused great alarm to Germany. Fisher strongly believed that Britain depended upon naval supremacy above all and that the army should be a subsidiary force. He called into question the huge budget allocated to the land forces and never tired of reiterating Sir Edward Grey's splendid words that the British Army was simply a projectile to be fired by the Navy. Fisher worked hard to influence the Committee of Imperial Defense and demanded, and demanded that every plan of offen for offensive hostilities against Germany should be subsidiary to the actions of the fleet. He was reluctant to discuss naval cooperations with the French whom he distrusted and kept even his most senior fellow officers in the dark. He did not believe in the plan for a military expeditionary force going to France. 
His presence was the schoolist Whig Holstein option in conjunction with the close naval blockade to starve Germany into submission. His ideas were dismissed by an ever-growing number of Committee of Imperial Defense and some senior figures in the Navy but Fisher's option. His ideas were dismissed by an ever-growing number of the Committee of Imperial Defense and some senior figures in the Navy. But Fisher's option for a close naval blockade warranted much more consideration than it was given despite the electoral promise of peace and retrenchment, Campbell Bannerman's ideals were success successfully thwarted. The first two years of the liberal government saw steady progress in building the foundations for war. Though no one outside the secret elite circle understood their true purpose, in January of 1908, Campbell Bannerman, who had suffered three heart attacks, felt terribly ill. The king really did wish to say goodbye to his prime minister, but such an inconvenience would have interrupted his holiday in Biarritz, and he had no wish to return to a fog-bound London. Sir Henry Camp Campbell Bannerman died in 10 Downing Street on Wednesday, 22nd of April. In an act of symbolic irony, Asquith was obliged to take the train to the south of France to kiss the royal hand before his appointment. King Edward was reportedly too far ill to travel back to London for such a mere formality. More likely he had no intention of interrupting his holiday just to appoint Asquith. It remains the only instance in which a British Prime Minister has formally taken office on foreign soil. There was much for Asquith to consider as he put the fishing touch finishing touches to his government. The secret elite kept in close contact days before Asquith's formal visit to Biarritz. Lord Escher was able to note in his diary that Lord George would become counselor of Winston Churchill, president of the Board of Trade. Asquith wrote from from, Biar, from Biarritz to offer them those precise positions, so it would so it is safe to assume that this was all approved by the secret elite beforehand. Some in the Liberal Party considered both men and men a danger, but his cabinet needed to be balanced. Lord George had a large following on the back benches and was popular with the whole with the working classes. Churchill had no such following, but was energetic and single hand and single minded. Asquith commented that Lord George has no principles and Winston no convictions. They appeared an extremely unlikely pairing. They appeared an extremely unlikely pairing. Winston Churchill came from the aristocracy and full accepted class distinction as part of the British way of life. Lord George came from the opposition, came from the opposite end of the social program and was consumed at times by class consciousness. Yet in the years that led to the French World War, the thing, yet in the years that led to the First World War, they moved together in a formidable partnership. Winston Churchill was an enigma for many in the inner circle of the of the uh, secret elite. They all knew him, and he knew all of them. Winston Winston's family connections allowed him access to Arthur Balfour. Herbert Asquith, Lord Rosebery, and Lord Rosechild, not to mention but a few. To mention but a few. His association with Alfred Milner dated back to South Africa, where he declared himself a great ad admirer of Milner's genius. Milner's genius. By birth and connection, by education and politics, by instinct and breeding. He had all of the necessary prerequisites. Churchill had, however, one fatal flaw. 
one characteristic that kept him at arm's length from the highest levels of influence. He was an unstoppable capacity to be maverick. He had a need to see himself and be seen by others as the current player. He was useful as an agent to energetically promote big ideals, but his enthusiasm could not be fully controlled. Churchill was an important political actor whom the secret elite influenced through the, throughout his career. Churchill was the product of a marriage of convenience. His father, Lord Randolph Churchill, son of the seventh Duke of Marlborough, was a spoiled playboy who wandered into conservative politics, gambled and frolicked in the entourage of the Prince of Wales, and died age 46 from syphilis. His debts to Lord Nathaniel Rothschild would be calculated in millions of pounds in today's money. Randolph's wife, Jenny Jerome, was the daughter of an ambitious, wealthy American businessman who paid a substantial sum to secure the marriage. She gave birth to Winston in 1874. And then some say, and then some serv- eight, seventy four some seven and a half months after their wedding in Paris, Jenny had little time for motherhood, and Winston was abandoned to his own nanny. He was kept at some distance from his parents and lacked maternal love and paternal interest. But th- but what did that matter when surrounded by all of the advantages of of privilege. David George had no such knowledge, had no such advantage. Born in Manchester in 1863, his father William, a school teacher, died when David was one years old. He was sent to live with his uncle, Richard Lloyd, who gave him a nonconformist education and a new name, Lord George. Self-motivated and ambitious, he wrote ungallantly to Margaret Owen, later his wife, My supreme idea is to get on. I'm prepared to thrust even love itself under the wheels of my judgment if it obstructs the way. Lloyd George was a gifted orator, though the establishment saw him as a rabble-rouser. He was elected to Parliament as Liberal MP for Carnarfon Boroughs in 1890 and and became an outspoken critic of the Boer War. He saw it as an, an outage perpetrated in the name of human freedom. While the war in South Africa was staunchly supported by Asquith, Gray, and Haldane, Lloyd George stayed true to his core, believed that it was an expensive waste, conducted in a blundering and cruel fashion. Parliamentary exchanges between Churchill and Lord George after 1900 revealed some common ground and a friendship of sorts, developed into evening dinners and serious discussions about policy and government. By 1904, Churchill had decided to switch allegiance and abandoned the conservatives. The reason he gave was ostensibly the issue of Joseph Chamberlain's conversion to a new scheme of tariffs and imperial preference. Detractors believed that Churchill abandoned the party because it was about to lose the, gen- the next election and he had little or no hope to attaining office and certainly not high office. There is another possibility. Was Churchill asked by the secret elite to defect the liberals in order to bring Lord George into the sphere, into sphere of direct influence? While this might seem an outrageous question, later developments lend it credence. Lloyd George had qualities that the secret elite could use. Leadership, sharp, acerbic, acerbic popularity wit wit and popularity with the masses 
He addressed colossal audiences, had no fears in parliamentary debate, cared passionately about social reform, and had credibility in the public arena that was unsurpassed in its time. He was ambitious, relatively poor, had no additional sources of income, no benefactors, or any likelihood of finding in any capitalist bare pit he railed against likelihood of finding any in the capitalist bear pit he ra- he railed against his enemies were the wealthy the aristocracy the privileged the warmongers and of course the L- house of lords he was a man of the people but as athquist had said he was certainly not a man of principle from the day he took office in athquist office in asquith's 1908 government as chancellor of the Exchequer. No one expected anything other than the liberal government's absolute opposition to war. Operation to massive spending on the machines of war, opposition to the naval race, and opposition to an exorbitant wealth. To an exorbitant wealth. All the core values that made Lord George, Lloyd George, the champion of liberal radicalism. No one, that is, except the secret elite, who were preparing the grounds to make him their man. Although Churchill and Lloyd George were friends, they were also rivals, both intended to be prime minister. They had a tendency to rile other cabinet ministers, even Richard Haldane, when they stated to demand cuts in military expenditure. In their early years in government, Lloyd George labeled Haldane Minister of Slaughter. Their crusade against the vast spending on the Navy in particular brought them into conflict with Gray and Haldane, which caused initial discomfort. They were, in 1908, the youngest generation knocking at the door, and the secret elite mentioned their progress with interest. Summary, Chapter 7, 1906, Landslide to Continuity The 1906 liberal landslide victory promised radical reform but brought no change in foreign policy. Gray continued, to grand de- Gray continued the grand design for war with Germany and was cocooned in the foreign office with seasoned permanent undersecretaries who were part of the secret elite. A close close examination of the list of politicians, diplomats, and newspapermen who knew about the secret military conversations provides a snapshot of key members of the secret elite in 1906. Haldane's reform of the War Office had the full backing of King Edward and the Committee of Imperial Defense. He transformed the organization of the British Army, but the Navy remained stuck in century-old tradition. Admiral Sir John Fisher introduced oil-driven warships and radically modernized the fleet. Fisher, however, believed in naval supremacy and that the Army should play a subsidiary role. He would not budge from his stubborn belief that the German fleet should be copenhagen and that the Royal Navy should attack Germany in a preemptive strike. The CID resolutely refused to accept his plans. Campbell Bannerman's death in 1908 gave the Relugas III unfettered control of the government. The secret elite knew and approved the cabinet reshuffle before it was confirmed to the ministries themselves. Two very different politicians, Churchill and Lord George, Lloyd George, were given cabinet posts from where their worth to the secret elite could be evaluated.